1.1%. That's the percentage of Arabs and Muslims living in America today. According to the US Census, Arabs are characterized as white, along with descendants from Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa. Historically, people who have been considered as white have benefited from white privileges. But are we really white though? Before I continue, for clarity's sake, I just wanted to state that I currently live in the Middle East, so now you know. When talking about racism while growing up here in the Middle East, as well as studying the subject in school, the topic was always about black and white. We studied all about slavery and how many Africans were forced into slavery in different parts of the world. I also read the book Roots as a teen. I was also exposed to the subject through TV, of course. I always remember being grateful and relieved that I didn't have to go through that kind of discrimination. As a kid, I felt a lot of sympathy for those Africans and blacks. I mean, how could someone live their lives as a slave with someone else controlling every part of their life, when they eat or sleep, what they do and where they go? In my mind, it was worse than prison. We were taught that we are all equal in front of God. So how can so many people go against God like that? I was so naive. It wasn't until I went to college in Chicago in 1995 that I found out that I wasn't white. My cousin there told me that we were classified as brown. This was a completely new color to me. I remember being demoralized after feeling so privileged all my life and that no one will ever bother me for the color of my skin. I felt so underprivileged now. I now had a disadvantage of being colored. What was I to do? Yes, that shocking news was a big deal to me. Although categorized into a dominant white racial classification, Arabs in America are still socially perceived as an other or outsider, alongside stereotypes associating the Arab label with anti-American sentiments. According to my knowledge, Jews have that same issue in America till today, as they are not considered pure white. Although Italians, who are considered darker than normal, especially the ones coming from southern Italy, have officially passed as white in the 19th century. I'm sorry if I'm making some of you uncomfortable while I talk about this sensitive topic, but I prefer to be open about this and not bullshit you guys. I have to talk about history, culture, psychology, and identity. So let me continue a little bit more. Psychology says that we are all prejudiced. This means we have an implicit or hidden bias towards certain groups, whether that be race, gender, age, or anything else. In my last video, I talked about tribalism and how that affects our prejudices as well. And it's simply in our nature to feel that way. It's only when we act on these prejudices is when it becomes discrimination. In previous videos also, I talked about Orientalism. That was caused by colonialism. All this leads to how others view us and how we view ourselves. I'm saying this because these biases affect whether we get a job or not. They affect our wages. They affect whether a stranger will stop and help us if we needed it. And how the police will treat us when they pull us over. Today, the largest Arab ancestries in the US are Lebanese, Egyptian, and Syrian, respectively. Palestinian, Moroccan, Iraqi, Jordanian, and Yemeni follow these also, in that order according to the US Census in 2013. From the 1% Arabs and Muslims, there's no doubt that Middle Easterners have a presence in America. It's easy to notice celebrities in the music and movie industries. While Vince Vaughn and Casey Kasem, or Qasim, were at one time two of America's biggest celebrities, who also both happen to be Lebanese. Also, public figures like Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar, who made a lot of noise in politics over the past couple of years. We can also find individuals of Arab descent in the field of science and medicine, like Dr. Michael Debaghi, who designed the artificial heart, and Ahmed Hassan Zouel, also Farouk al Baz and Fawaz Ulabi, who both worked at NASA. Let's also not forget two of my favorites, Jubran Khalil Jubran and Edward Said, who are both famous for their literary work. And the list goes on. 
Well, it's obvious that like the other 97% of Americans, including my parents, that we are all originally immigrants who traveled from all over the world to come to this special place called America. Technically, we can exclude the 13.4% of African Americans who are not originally immigrants. They were historically slaves forced to come to America. I feel really awkward saying that, but it's worth mentioning. Arab immigration to the United States has occurred in three waves. The first wave, 1924 to 1947, during the Depression and World War II. The second wave, 1948 to 1966, following the Nakba adversity, a war between Jews and Palestinians, referred to as the Arab-Israeli War. And the third wave, 1967 to 2005, throughout internal conflict in the West Bank, Lebanon, Iraq, and Kuwait. Middle Easterners, especially the Muslim ones, have faced a lot of challenges ever since we stepped foot in this country. Part of this challenge was fitting in and being accepted by America. I remember being embarrassed in the first grade when I was asked to say my last name, Abdul Hamid, in front of the whole class. I was embarrassed because I was the only Arab in class and I knew my name sounded odd or out of place, even though I was in the Bronx, New York, one of the most diverse cities in the world. I still felt different. Plus, believe it or not, I was very shy as a kid and far from being outspoken. Maybe I'm overcompensating now. Who knows? As immigrants, we come from our home countries with our own names, skin color, clothes, language, food, social and behavioral norms and beliefs and values. Some of these attributes fit in the communities we live in, and many of them simply stand out. This is one big reason why we are looked at as strangers, outsiders who don't belong. Let's face it, many people fear what they don't understand and what's different. That's why immigrants go through so much hassle. Fast forward to New York, September 11, 20 years ago, where many Arabs and Muslims went through a pretty tough time while being blamed for the tragic loss that many American families suffered. Two decades later, and we are still not in the clear. According to a paper by Claudia Joachim called Racial and Ethnic Identity in the Chicagoland area, Arab American millennials have come to internalize their Middle Eastern ethnic and religious identity due to 9-11. She says the social experiences of Arab American millennials are frequently made in relation to the attacks play a pivotal role in the construction of their identity. So even though some of us are indistinguishable from European whites, we both still find it difficult to define ourselves as white nor even be considered as white by other American ethnic communities. Even though the US Census classifies Arabs as white, even grouping black Arabs from Sudan and by extension other black and brown people who are Arabic speaking settled in other parts of the MENA region under this category, many sociologists argue that although Arab Americans may racially identify as white, their perception of themselves is not in harmony with their state-given classification. I've come a long way since the first grade, and so have many other Arab Americans, and this series is being made to tell their story. So let's find out together who were the first Middle Easterners to come to America, and when, and why is it important to know about it. If you want to be notified about my next video, just simply subscribe and hit that notification button. I'll be talking about the very beginning of America, Christopher Columbus and the Spanish Muslims, Muslim slaves like Kunta Kinte, and even a guy called Mansa Musa, and how they influenced bringing Muslims to America. So stay tuned. And if you would like to help me continue my work, consider supporting Optimistic Arab on Patreon. Until next time.